the Wittig reaction. And that's Wittig with a big fat German W right there. So that's Wittig on the proper pronunciation. And uh, the Wittig reaction, another example of a carbon nucleophile. And it's fairly unique uh, and distinct in how it works. And so I decided to cover it in a totally separate lesson from the other carbon nucleophiles. It really does deserve, deserve its own video here. So uh, that's what we're going to cover in this lesson. We'll find out that we're going to convert a carbon oxygen double bond into a carbon carbon double bond net result. And while there is some variety in Wittig reagents, we're just going to simply reserve ourselves to using the most common type of Wittig reagent, uh, which is more than likely all you're going to see in your undergraduate course. Now this lesson is part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so again, net result of your Wittig reaction, it's gonna turn a carbon oxygen double bond into a carbon carbon double bond as well. And so if you're looking at this from like a synthesis perspective, so that's kind of your big tell. If your carbon oxygen double bond turns into a carbon carbon double bond, you are probably doing something with a Wittig reaction. And, and oftentimes you gotta look at these from a little bit of a retro synthesis perspective. And so we're actually gonna kind of do this a little backwards and start there. So what we wanna do is actually go backwards from the alkene, break it in half, to kind of predict what reactants we would have had. And if you look for the best possible Wittig setup, you wanna see whichever side of the alkene, whichever one of these sp2 carbons is less substituted. And in this case, that's this side up here. And then this side is the more substitute side. The more substitute side, you're better off making the ketone or aldehyde. So the less substitute side ultimately will have come from an alkyl halide, like an alkyl bromide. Cool, and so initially in your synthesis, one side comes from an alkyl halide, the other side comes from a ketone or aldehyde. That's the result. So I uh, just wanna keep that in mind if we are predicting a good retrosynthesis here. And the key is, uh, the reason we're picking him to be an alkyl halide is it's gonna be involved in an SN2 reaction along the way. And for SN2, you want the least hindered backside attack, and that's why we chose the less substituted side of the alkene to have originated as part of the alkyl halide. So that's kind of the deal here. So. All right, so let's take a look at how this works here instead of the net result. And uh, it turns out that the alkyl halide you've got here is eventually gonna get converted into So this guy right here with a positive formal charge on phosphorus and a negative formal charge on carbon here. And we call this thing a phosphoilid. Another weird spelling, Y-L-I-D-E, so phosphoilid. That's this guy here. But you can see with a negative charge on carbon, it's a carb anion. So in this case, it's stabilized inductively by being next to a uh, positive formal charge phosphorus here. So, but this carb anion is our nucleophile. Now, it's easy to recognize this as a nucleophile here, but you should realize that with phosphorus being able to go over the octet rule, we can actually represent this with another resonance structure. And it's not so obvious that it's a nucleophile in that case. So, but in this case, and sometimes we just put P, oh, we don't even use parentheses actually. We just put P, PH3. So another way to draw it. And, and so instead we just kind of use the lone pair here to form a double bond to phosphorus since phosphorus allowed to go over the octet rule. And so sometimes you'll see it drawn like this and you have to recognize that this bond is indeed polar with a partial negative charge on carbon, partial positive charge on phosphorus, and reacts just as if it were a carb anion. So keep that in mind. You might see either resonance structure, you might see them draw both, you know, in resonance brackets and stuff like this. So, but I draw this one because it's much easier to recognize that he's a good carbon nucleophile. Let's take a look at that mechanism. So the mechanism here from our phosphoil is just gonna start off with nucleophilic attack here, just like it has in the other reactions. And our carbon nucleophile is going to be the nucleophile. Push the pi electrons up. And a couple things to point out here, the pH here is a, an abbreviation for a phenyl group. These are benzene rings. So here phosphorus is bonded to three benzene rings, just in case that wasn't clear. All right. Uh, one, two, three. So one, two, three. All right, so here's this three carbon chain. One, two, three. One, two, three. And again, that first carbon's bonded to the PPH3 to the PPH3. So you get this lovely intermediate just from the result of nucleophilic attack. We got our lovely alkoxide, and here's the nucleophile that's attached. So 
Next step here is not rocket science here. You got a negatively charged oxygen right next to a positively charged phosphorus and oxygen's like, hey, how you doing? And we're gonna form a four-membered ring right here. And again, remember phosphorus is allowed to violate the octet rule. But here we end up with an intermediate where oxygen's not negatively charged and phosphorus is not positively charged, just exceeding the octet, which is totally okay. Third row and lower, you're allowed to go over. Cool, now the question is, you know, we're, seems like a long ways away from our final product here, except we're actually only one mechanistic step away. So this whole ring structure is actually going to collapse here. And what you're gonna have happen is you're gonna end up with this bond moving over to this location to end up with a phosphorus oxygen double bond and cyclic movement of electrons here, this bond moves over to form a carbon-carbon double bond right here. And you can see that we're actually breaking this into two separate products here. Net result. Cool, and this guy's just a byproduct and we'll recycle him, so. But there's your alkene product. And again, it, it's a little bit funky and students struggle with this last mechanistic step. So, but really it's just the cyclic movement of four electrons here. So forming both your carbon-carbon double bond and your phosphorus oxygen double bond. So separating these into two separate products. Cool, so that's the Vitig, uh, the nucleophilic attack part of it. So what we haven't actually shown though is where's this phosphoilid come from? And I alluded to earlier back in the day, back in the day, back at the beginning of this lesson that, you know, we're kind of predicting where the original reactants are. We saw this guy was the ketone. Then we saw that this guy was an alkyl halide. And so the other thing we have to show is where this phosphoilid comes from, because these three carbons are initially the three carbons of that alkyl halide. And so oftentimes part of an actual overall synthesis is going to be often forming the phosphoilid from the corresponding alkyl halide. And that's what we're going to take a, a moment to do here for just a sec. So we've got a lovely alkyl halide. We want to turn it ultimately into again our phosphoilid here. And the question is how do we get there? Well it turns out the first step is just going to be an SN2 reaction and that's why we wanted the least hindered alkyl halide possible. In this case primary halide, that's fantastic. And what we're going to use here is phosphorus bonded to three benzene rings, three phenyl groups. We call this triphenylphosphine. So, and he's just gonna come and do backside attack on the carbon with a leaving group, kick off that leaving group. Cool, leaving us with this lovely intermediate. This is not the same as our product though. And if you look and try and figure out the difference, you'll see that this carbon right here has two hydrogens, but over here, he's just got one. So, and ultimately he's just been deprotonated. That's the only difference here. So we need to deprotonate one of the two hydrogens here on a carbon. Well, deprotonating a carbon is usually fairly challenging. Uh, and for an average carbon, we don't really have good bases for that. So if you had to deprotonate an acetylide ion, well, we know how to pull that off. Like sodium A might be a good example. So, but for a normal carbon, deprotonating, not the easiest thing. The only reason we're allowed to do it here though is because we've got this stabilizing, positively charged phosphorus right next to it. So inductively, it's gonna stabilize the result. And so we're still gonna need a super duper strong base to pull this off, but at least we can do it. And it turns out the most common super duper strong base we're going to use is usually just written as butyl lithium here, but that is one, two, three, four carbons bond to a lithium, so it's an organometallic. So, and this carbon-lithium bond is even more polar than a carbon-magnetic bond. And so these are even more reactive than Grignard reagents. They're both stronger nucleophiles, and more importantly for this reaction, stronger bases than Grignard reagents. And so this guy's just gonna come over here and deprotonate that hydrogen. Cool, and that's gonna form some butane and some lithium ions in the process, but those are just byproducts, don't care about them, we'll wash them away. So, but we formed our phosphoilid here. And that phosphoilid is what we then combine with our ketone or aldehyde uh, to form an alkene.
Cool, that is the Wittig reaction. I mentioned really briefly at the beginning that there are other examples of uh, Wittig reagents that are not phosphoilid. Some involve sulfur and things like this. But again, the vast majority of you, probably more than 90%, not going to see them at all. For the other, you know, less than 10% of you, my apologies for not covering them, uh, but just biggest bang for your buck on the Wittig reaction. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson on the Wittig reaction as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on aldehydes and ketones, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.